Welcome to the Fit and Free with AIM podcast. I'm your host, Amy Louise. By listening to this podcast, you'll gain clarity and apply now principles in relation to training, nutrition, and mindset, all designed to help you build a strong and lean physique and show up as your best self. If you're a woman who struggles with excessive behaviors when it comes to training and food and think of yourself as a perfectionist, I hear you, I see you, I was you. And I know that you're in exactly the right place to change that narrative and build a body you love inside and out. Let's go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this very special episode of the podcast. I have my wonderful client, best friend, VA Jess with us. Hello. (laughs) And I thought it would be a great topic to ask Jess how her bikini prep is going so far. I think there'd be heaps of you guys interested. If you have been following the podcast or either of us for a a period of time, you'll know we've been working together for, is it just over two years now? Yeah, it was two years in December. Yeah, just over two years now. And you might have seen just what Jess has gone through in the last two years. But then, of course, if you had followed Jess prior to that, you know she's had a massive, massive journey. Uh, And if you don't know Jess, I'll leave her um, Instagram in the show notes so you can jump on and have a look because it's ridiculous. Actually, could you just give us a little quick rundown of like before coming to me? Sure, can. So I'll give you the cliff noted version because it's been a bit of a journey. Um, 2019, start of 2019, I decided I was sick of being very overweight um, and didn't want to hate my future wedding photos. And I was like, you know what, let's lose some weight. So it was actually mid-April 2019 um, with the help of my mum, who's a PT but lives a long way away, um, I entered my own sort of developed calorie deficit um, and proceeded on my weight loss journey and in 13 months lost just shy of 50 kilos. So um, that was all done entirely by myself, just like mum and I working it out. Um, And so then July of 2020, I um, started with my first coach and we worked together for six months-ish. And then during that time, I was in COVID lockdown being in Victoria and I put a deadlift video up and Amy slid into my DMs and was like, yo, you're squatting, not deadlifting. Um, And then we back and forth a bit. And then I ended up um, moving over to Amy in December of 2020. And then we've been together since doing a mix of, um, we started in a deficit, then did maintenance, did close to a 12 month surplus. And now we've been prepping for a bikini competition. And I just want to say, Jess lost 50, five, zero on her own, just in case you heard 50 and thought, oh, she must have said 15. No, no, no. She <laughs> lost 50 kilos on her own. <laughs> so just yeah. want to chuck that out. There. <laughs> um, I think one of the coolest things with Jess is, well, of course, hang on a second. She's a dynamic human. There are lots of amazing things about Jess. <laughs> But um, with her, specifically with her fat loss journey, is that not only did she manage to lose 50 kilos on her own, yes, she had a help of her mum for sure, um, but largely on your own. Um, yeah. Jess has been able to maintain that, you know, this whole time. And I think a lot of people really struggle with maybe they'd lose 30 kilos and then gain 30, 40 kilos back. Yeah, I did that for a while before this time. So I'd always done like you typically, you know, like lose 10 gain 15 um and you know head back and forth for a while and just never you know managed to do it and I think just that had a lot to do with the strategies and ways I was going about it um so yeah but no I think sometimes I forget like the fact that it has been nearly four years um since I did that and have maintained it and I think at the end of the day that's what I'm most proud of it's not the initial 50 kilo loss it's the fact that you know we're still here today four years later Well, that's exactly what I wanted to highlight to everyone listening. Like this is where it starts to become like, I don't know the statistics. I've said to you, it's like one in a million. (laughs) Um, It just, it seems like that for such a significant amount to have completely changed one's lifestyle multiple years on, uh, it is, yeah, it's it's such a testament to you and I guess the lifestyle you wanted to create for yourself because when we look at it, and I think if you would look at the lifestyle difference, 
you know, you make a lot of sacrifices now. There's no doubt. You make a lot of sacrifices now. And, you know, it's given you this result that you really love. Yeah. <laughs> but it has come with massive sacrifice, massive change, massive discomfort. Part of what we're going to talk about today is discomfort. Uh, so I just would love to highlight that to people that I think when when I'm showing your progress on my account, Jess, it's just from, uh, you know, this back half of the journey. And I understand people will think that she's lucky. It's her genetics. She's always been lean. She's always been jacked. Like people will think, I, I think people will think that about yeah. you. And that's why I've constantly said, can you also go onto her page and see what the previous version was? Because it's just mind blowing. So I, Sometimes pre- I want to like say that at the gym, there's been a couple of times I've had people come up to me and they're like, wow, you look amazing and all those sorts of things. And especially there's been a couple of times where I've had women come up who were very much like me at the start of my journey. And they're like, oh, wow, you know, like you're such an inspiration and stuff. And I always just want to tell them, I was like, I did weigh 50 kilos more, not to like toot my own horn, but to be like, you know, because I can remember thinking I can't do this, even though I was there trying to do it, I can't do it. And I was like, I'm never going to look like one of those people. And I always just want to remind them, I'm like, no, you can. (laughs) That was me um, and you can do it. Um, So, yeah, I like to remind them of that if they ever say anything I'm like I wasn't always like this like it is possible for you to do this too I love that I you know what I love most about that is hearing you say even when you're in the process of it you still had those thoughts of I can't so I just want to say to people it's okay if you have the I can't thoughts and you're not there's nothing wrong with you it doesn't mean you won't we all still have these thoughts that come up during the process where it's like, this isn't working. I can't. The only difference is the people who do take that and then just believe it and stop. It's not the absence of those thoughts. We don't need the absence of those thoughts. All we need to do is keep going. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Um, Okay, cool. So I've got, (laughs) <laughs> I've got a few questions written up and I thought we would just go through them. So the first one is what shows are you doing? What division federation? Um, so I'm looking to do three shows. So uh, my first show will be the NBA Sydney show. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is obviously I live in Victoria, but I'm originally from Sydney and all my family are there. And, um, you know, for me, a lot of this experience and the reason I'm doing this isn't, you know, to get on stage and win, uh, you know, a medal or whatever, that would be nice, but it's to sort of like, just, you know, show off the journey I've been on. And I want my family to be able to experience that too. And I know them getting down to Melbourne is a bit tricky. So that's going to be our first show. Um, and at this stage, we're looking to do bikini and swimsuit, um, possibly sports model. We'll sort of see how I'm tracking physique wise in the coming weeks um so that'll be show one then show two is the melbourne nba show um which i think is the start of may um so we'll do that and again um bikini and swimsuit and then i'm looking to do the melbourne inba which again bikini swimsuit possibly sports model we'll wait and see so yes that's what i'm looking to do Awesome. Now, can you rewind to a few days before you started prep, if you can remember far back? Far back. How were you feeling a few days before you started? Um, I do actually remember because it was um, between, it was just after my birthday um, and going into like school holidays. So I remember quite clearly. Um, it, I was excited, like really excited. I think definitely a bit nervous for what it was going to hold and you know there was definitely some not doubts but just some concerns around being able to manage the demands with full-time work um and those sort of things and especially the sort of full-time work I do where I have zero flexibility in hours or or things like that and I was like you know it's going to be hard I also travel um 45 minutes each way for work and things like that but you know, I was like, well, we'll work it out. We'll make it work. Um, But yeah, I think it was just really excitement. I just really wanted to get going. We'd been in a surplus for a long time. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to see what we've achieved. Mm. And how, how do you feel now? So I just want to say, why am I laughing? So Jess and I have developed a really close relationship. So we tell each other a lot. And of course I've been on the end of 
personal messages between Jess and I. So that's why I'm laughing, but I'll, yeah, Jess. Yeah. Um, look, up until probably this last week, we'd been really good. We've been tracking pretty well. I had a few moments where I was like, oh, I'm tired and, you know, whatever, I'm hungry. But for the most part, we'd been really good. This last week, oh, my God, it's like, <laughs> it's like we're, what, 15 weeks, I think, in. We've got 13, 14 to go. So we're starting to get to that nitty-gritty end. And up until this week, I was like, I don't know what all these people complain about. Like, this is great. I'm loving life. Well, lo and behold, it's caught up with me. Um, and this past week has been hard. Um, I think, you know, a combination of just general fatigue um, from, you know, lack of energy availability and things like that. I also, because overachiever things, decided to get a brand new puppy um, who <laughs> does not like to sleep. Um, so, you know, small amounts of sleep and all of those things this week has caused me to be very emotional and quite irrational. Um, for example, the other day, I think it was Tuesday, um, I sent a message and I was like, I'm literally sobbing in my car, driving to the gym because I have to go do steps. Like it was so irrational and I knew I was being irrational, but I just had no control over the tears coming out. That, like I was full blown sobbing. I haven't cried like that for a long time over having to go do steps on a treadmill. Um, so, you know, this week's this week's been a bit of an emotional roller coaster, but we're getting there. Um, I've got two questions from that. So, the the first question is, when you're having a meltdown, <laughs> what is like if people could sort of get inside your head, what's the thought process of that meltdown? Like, if you can, if you if you're happy to be open. Yeah, I think it it sort of depends on what the meltdown's over. I had a meltdown on Sunday. Um, when I did check-in photos um, and I did my check-in photos and they, in my head, they didn't look good enough and I did my posing routine and it just, it just wasn't happening for me on Sunday and I got myself in a tizzy over it and I was like, I don't have enough time, I'm not going to look like, I'm going to look out of place on stage, my posing's rubbish and I, I had a meltdown. And in my head, in those moments, it's like complete irrationality. Like you, you just can't, like you, it's weird because I know I'm being irrational, but there's no bringing myself back either. It's just, you know, I haven't put in enough work. You just really start to doubt yourself and doubt everything. And regardless of the fact that I've got the data and I know that I'm ticking every single box consistently, it just, yeah, you spiral. Um, you do, but that's where, you know, your support system around you is important to sort of bring you back down and be your emotional regulation to some extent, because you really do just lose that ability to do it yourself. Yeah. Did you ever have similar thoughts in that initial 50 kilo weight loss? Did you ever have as down a moment as that? No, not like this. I think because there wasn't like something like it was important on the line, but not like this. Like it was like, Oh, if the 50 kilos don't come off in 12 months and it takes 18 months. It's a bit different. Whereas there's such a strict timeline to this. And I'm like, I literally only have that amount of time. I think it makes those lows a bit lower, but the highs higher too. So you sort of get both extremes. Yeah, I think it would be the fact that it's so publicly accountable. The fact that, like, the fact of the matter is with this sport, um, whilst it's, I was going to say, whilst it's not physically, like, risky or dangerous, I was kind of thinking of, like, snowboarding or something, but maybe it is. <laughs> um, you know, you're getting lights shone on you on a stage. Like, there's nowhere to fucking hide. I think that those sorts of things can add to it, plus, of course, the low energy availability as well, making your emotional resilience lower. So I imagine there are some, uh, there are some multiple factors going into yeah. that. I think also for me that, you know, is probably an additional factor that, you know, not speaking on behalf of everyone else, but that other people won't come into this with is I'm also very aware that my, like, yes, I'm jacked and I've got that, but I'm also battling the fact that I was morbidly obese for the first 28 years of my life and I physically have reminders of that in terms of loose skin and things like that and there's nothing I can do about that but I have to 
like go up in competition with people who don't have to do with that. And so coming into it, I was always like, am I, even if I tick every single box and do it all, can I actually get myself to look like someone who hasn't done that and compete against them on like a level playing field, be competitive against them. And I think that's also just a constant in the back of my mind, an extra sort of battle I have to, to have with my own head to be like, you know, yeah. you'll be fine. But yeah, it's just that extra element. Yeah. I appreciate that insight. You spoke about having a support system. I know Ben is amazing. <laughs> Can you yeah. talk through what Ben said to you? Cause I think it was just like, it's the best. Yeah, so um, for anyone that doesn't know, I have the most patient husband on the planet. Honestly, if I was married to me, I would have walked out by now because, oh, man, that man is a blessing from God. Um, But on Sunday, preface, Ben watches all of my check-in videos. So when we started, when I said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to prep, and I sort of said to him, he doesn't come from this world, he doesn't understand it, but I said, this is going to be a lot and there's a lot I'm going to have to do. He said, all right, well, I want to watch your check-in videos each week so I know what you need to be doing and I can sort of help you and and all of that. And I was like, you're amazing. So he's watched my check-in videos for an extended period of time now and he has become Amy. Um, So on Sunday when I had this meltdown over, um, you know, not being ready in time and not looking the part, he um, basically turned to me and said, he goes, you know, at the end of the day, you can't control who gets on that stage and what they think you look like and you've got no control over that. He goes, what you do have control over is all of the things you do to get you to that point and if you do all of those, then you can be proud of yourself and that's the most important thing is that you are proud of yourself at the end of this process, not what the number outcome is. And I was like, huh, you sound like Amy. (laughs) It's just incredibly helpful advice. And if you are listening, this is applicable to everything to do with training performance, to do with any physique goals that you have, to do with healthy habit accumulation, all of it. It is so much focused on um, what 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 can we do? What is in your control and understanding and being able to re- reiterate to yourself over and over again, like these are the things that I do have control of. Scale weight is something I can't control, right? You just, you can't, you can't do that. Uh, with a comp prep, you can't pick the biases of the judges. You can't, especially with a show, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but you will often get judged on, what is the type of physique on the stage at the time and against those those physiques? If there is an overwhelming majority of physiques, so they all have certain features and all look similarly, they will be grouped up the better end. And anyone who looks kind of different will be down the lower end. And that's regardless of conditioning or muscle mass or whatever. It's the majority. It's a really weird thing that people don't know. But this is why you can see the same sorry, this is why you can see the same person at different shows place really, really differently. They might come first one week and then seventh the next. And it's because we don't know who were the other people up on stage and how their physique compared to the majority. Yeah, It's a really interesting thing. And physique sports is so unpredictable. Unfortunately, there are some, or actually it's really just one specific federation in one specific state that has extreme biases in terms of the judging and the politics. Uh, From what we understand, the others are okay. Okay. But when there is a sport like this, it's not like who can deadlift the most since there's a clear winner. This is very, very subjective. And I think sometimes what people don't understand with being judged on your physique it's really got nothing to do with like I I think when people hear the word being judged on your physique it really emotionally upsets a lot of people yeah but I think if we can take the emotion out of it and go like there are a set of criteria you're being judged against other physiques there's no like morality who's a good person who's done the most training who's the most proficient in their exercises all that none of that exists right so I get it I get it that it's a weird sport to be wanting to pursue but at the same time please understand that the you know how they choose the winners how they're deciding the winners it's very 
it, it's based on a set of criteria, but also very subjective in terms of who turns up on the day really matters. Yeah. Um, and it can change a lot of things. So I wanted to ask Jess, what's, what's the difference <clears throat> between a fat loss phase and a comp prep? Um, probably the two main differences are one is the period of time. Um, (laughs) like this is an extended period of time. Um, but also I think it's just that room for, um, sort of like negotiation. Like when you're in a generic fat loss phase, there's a little bit more wriggle room with things like, oh, I'll go out for dinner. Yes. I'll get like a steak, veg and salad or I estimate my calories, it may not be exactly spot on, but it'll be okay, that's fine. Whereas you sort of start to lose that wriggle room in a comp prep because everything is, is, especially at this tail end, every little thing makes such a difference. Um, and, yeah, I think it's, it's those little things, um, that little bit of breathing space you get in a normal deficit, although I generally allow myself in a normal deficit, that is just non-existent in a comp prep. That's probably how I imagine that's how you've experienced me too, right? Like I would have been pretty flexible and very accommodating in fat in your previous fat loss phases, but have you noticed how I've turned into a, like, I don't have any empathy for you? Yes, 100%. I, I get zero, zero empathy from her these days. Um, but I think you also need that. Like, I think there's some... I know some people choose to allow themselves that bit of wriggle room in a comp prep and it is something you can do. For me, it can start to become a slippery slope. I'm better off just, you know, hitting exactly what it needs to be. And then at the end of the day too, you're not going to look back. For me, I'm not going to look back and be like, I shouldn't have had that one meal out because, you know, I know that, you know, I hit everything as I should have. Yeah. And I'll be really open and honest. It's not something I'm sharing a lot on my stories. I'm not even sharing my own comp prep in terms of those details. I am sharing more on YouTube, but definitely not on my Instagram because it's not helpful for the typical woman I coach. I don't coach competitors. Jess is the yeah. first competitor I'm coaching. I don't want to continue to not, <laughs> not <laughs> have this experience, yeah. um, but I, I haven't wanted to. And it's just because we have to, develop such a close relationship we've been working together for so long and I have complete and utter trust in Jess and it's something we've built together Uh, and it would honestly it would take exactly the same for another person to come on board for a comp prep it's not what I it's not my mission in life to help people compete it's definitely my mission in life to help women um, have fun with their physique to improve their training performance let go of all of their anxieties And comp prep can really exacerbate a whole lot of shit. So it's definitely not something I just, I would ever take lightly and would ever just take anyone who I don't know. And this is. It it took enough convincing to get you to take me on. There definitely was, when I said, I want, I want to do this. There was a lot of, all right, you know, we'll find someone who can do that because you just were, it's not your general, general desire. So I'm glad I convinced you in the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess I guess this podcast episode is in no way me trying to uh, get clients for comp prep. Absolutely not. Please don't message me about it. Um, unless you do want a, a contact for a coach that I can give you other coaches who are amazing at it. But initially, yeah, I actually it was for quite a while. Jess was um, saying that she wanted to compete and I was saying, great, there's another coach that you can go with and it's not going to be me and this will be the end of the road for us. <laughs> yeah. um, we had a countdown going and everything. I was like, oh, I only have this many sessions left with you and, and those things. And then, yeah. Yeah, so it's absolutely not something that I take lightly and it's, yeah, it's, it's, for me to have wanted to pursue this as a significant level of trust between both of us, I think, and um, an honest communication, which is really, really critical, I think, when you're going through a comp prep because I think that I have worked with clients where I know that they're not being honest and even later they'll tell me that they weren't. Uh, and yeah, it's really, really critical to do that. So, all right. The next question is, I want to know what's posing been like so far? Oh, you know what? When someone says, what's the hardest part of competing? 
this this is it the food the like training none of that that is easy I aside from my meltdown over steps but that part's easy posing oh man it is by far the hardest thing I have if you can hear my dog I've got one dog in the pantry with me and the other dog's outside hold on it's literally a menagerie in here um posing has been really hard so I've been working on my posing for like mm, what maybe 14 months now and I feel like I'm slowly starting to get the hang of it um but also like I swear every time you learn something new something else goes out the window and then you're constantly adjusting it definitely has been hard and for someone who's not good at not being good at things it's really challenged me I found that the first time around too. I hated it, really didn't like posing and was just saying in my head, I remember in the last few weeks, why can't I just squat or why can't I just run in a like a time limit or something? Or why can't I just show my logbook of hours trained? I think I messaged you on the weekend and I was like, why can't I pose like a male bodybuilder? Like this is so much easier. Like let me just show my biceps and my back and I'll be fine. Um, it's the finesse required that is is difficult. That's the thing with bikini too. There's a couple of components of the bikini division that are like very much about presence and glam and confidence and wouldn't say sexiness. I would just say confidence. Um, And then there's also that element of like beauty or art that comes with it in terms of like, if anyone does dance and they understand how routines are put together, it's uh, how does it flow? Does it all work with, with um, you know, the whole routine? Does it match the person's personality? Like, there's yeah. a lot of this in the bikini division. So when you're thinking, oh, people just getting shredded, yeah, and. Yeah, and learning <laughs> how to, you know, very quickly glance down to draw attention to a body part before, you know, it's the tiniest little things that you just don't yeah. realise until you're in it doing it that makes such a difference though. And bikinis judged on tan, judged on bikini, judged on hair, makeup, jewelry. Yeah. All it's all included. Again, some people don't realize that, but it all matters. And it's really interesting too. You can have two physiques, say one looks better against the criteria unposed, two women who, you know, one looks better, and then the posing is off, her confidence is not there or something, and she'll be marked down. Yeah. So the, the posing, the routine, the flow, the look, all of it is, it, it really, really matters. It's equally, if not more important than the other parts. Like you can come in being, as you said, the leanest, shredders, like ticking all the physical boxes. But if you don't have the presence, it doesn't matter. Like someone who doesn't look, you know, as much as the criteria, but they do have the presence, they'll take it out. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, it's it's frustrating, but it also makes sense at the same time. Yeah. All right. So what's been your favorite part so far of the comp prep? Um probably up, up until this week, the routine and structure. I thrive off like strict routine and structure and having some very explicit boxes to pick. Um, and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy just going through that that process and having those like, you know, strict parameters around what I'm doing I think it just brings out the best version of myself um and you know it it makes me more productive in lots of areas of my life because you have to just you know literally be your like best most productive version of yourself in all areas because you have so little time to designate to everything you're like I need to make the most of all of these bits of time if posing wasn't part of it what's your least favorite part (laughs) Um, oh, that's a good one. I think losing a little bit of the enjoyment for training, um, like training. And I think I said this to you yesterday. I said, for me, my coping mechanisms are training and walking, like going out and getting steps. If, you know, the day's been rough, I'll go for a walk. That's where I sort of like have my moment and they've now become jobs. Um, and not to say I'm not loving training, but I miss you know, going in there and being like, yes, let's go train. Now I'm like, let's go train. Like, yeah, let's do this again. And I think that's, you know, A, because you're constantly just doing things, but B, 
that lack of like energy availability starts to impact your ability to train as hard as I could when I was in a surplus. And that's frustrating at times. It's really funny. So Jess is, sorry, was it 15 weeks in now? Yeah. Just messaged me a few days ago and was like, at what point is it okay if I'm not continuously progressing in my training? And I'm like, weeks ago, bro. <laughs> and, and it's like, um, you know, it's not something as a coach I would ever say, like expect your training to get worse. It's, I really don't want to be putting those thoughts in people's heads. And it's just like organically when it happens, it happens. And I'll um, give her that reality check that she needs when it, hap- when it happens. But as a coach, I think it is really important if you are a coach and listening, just be, just watch your language that you're not filling your clients with uh, thoughts about what might happen that might actually deter them. Yeah. So as much as we can, we want to not bullshit them, uh, but it's more so you don't need to talk about something bad potentially happening if it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Uh, you just let it happen organically and then you can manage the expectation, I think. Yeah, and that's exactly what had happened. I think up until we had, I think, that message, the conversation in terms of like my weight, my reps, all of those things just hadn't been something that had been brought up in check-ins. Like I can't remember the last time you were like, oh, I see you're progressing or all of this or whatever. Like it is, it's literally been weeks. And it was when I was doing my sets of deadlifts and I was like, I just don't think I can do any more than I did last week. I was like, am I meant to be feeling like this or should I still be progressing? And you're like, no, it's okay. I was like, oh. And it was almost like a little bit of relief because I was like, I actually don't think I can keep pushing any harder. I mean, I did end up pushing harder because I'm that kind of human, but it was like a little bit of, you know, if I can't one day or I can't one session, that's okay. Yeah. I had, so I'm only like, what, I was going to say two weeks into mine, but I'm not. I'm like six weeks. Yeah, you're a while. I don't know. And uh, I was struggling last week. Actually, no, I've been struggling for a long time with any progression. And my coach had said to me, like, just given the fact how long you've been training for, how like high level technique, you you know, you've been um, exhibiting for so long. We're just not, even at six weeks in, we're just not going to be expecting anything to be progressing like crazy at all. And and, uh, having this knowledge as a coach myself, it's like, I know if I can push on a certain day, push and do it and take the win. But at the same time, it's just not a big deal. It's nothing to even think about twice if I can't, except for just, you know, writing the numbers in my program so my coach can see. But again, it's it's just not something to be concerned about. Again, the, the difference is with a typical fat loss phase, people will write themselves off in the first week and it's just, it makes zero sense. You've got plenty of energy to energy stores to draw on. And a typical gen, general population fat loss phase, I actually wouldn't really expect to see things go backwards in terms of training. Uh, I would expect the person to hit maybe maintenance again and where they're not able to progress their lifts, but they are able to maintain. But that's not until maybe the 10, 12 week mark. Some of it may be psychological. Some of it will be real. But like, please don't be writing yourself off in the start of a deficit just because so many people on Instagram are telling you that, you know, like how bad deficits are and you can't make progress and blah, blah, blah. It's like, look, only up to a point, right? I was thinking yeah. about that the other day. Like everyone's like comp prep is unhealthy. And it's like, it becomes unhealthy at about, I don't know, the 12 week out mark, the 10 week out mark, maybe the eight or the six week out mark. But yeah. the first part of it, just being in a deficit isn't actually unhealthy. No, it's it's going to take a point and then yeah. it becomes unhealthy. And I think for me, I think I said that to you the other day. I said, I feel like now, like as of this sort of last week, I've hit the cap on like gen pop, deficit lean like we've hit that point and this is normally where you'd stop and you're like like all my health markers are still really good I'm still sleeping well I'm still progressing with my training my cycle's still regular everything is normal we've lost like you know a 30 kilos really good successful deficit phase and for a normal gen pop person this is where you'd be like cool let's stop, let's, you know, come out of this back to maintenance and enjoy the physique. It's really only this next bit that starts to become less healthy. But even still, like, you know, we're very explicitly, and I said that to you, and I think that's one of the reasons why I so wanted to convince you to take me through this, is I don't want to do this and completely destroy my health. That was 
that's not what I want to do. I understand there's going to be a point where it becomes unhealthy, but if I can become unhealthy in the healthiest way possible, that's what I'm after to do. And, you know, that's meant in terms of macros and things like that. They're, you know, sometimes not the most enjoyable because we're trying really hard to keep those health markers because it doesn't have to be like cripplingly unhealthy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always hear that like, on prep so unhealthy and it's like yeah absolutely but that first part no no even with fat loss you know I think I think it's great that more people are saying that if you don't need to lose body fat then you know there's no point just hang around at maintenance engage in healthy habits that's all great but there's for some reason it's like with the pendulum swung and it's like any fat loss anything to do with being in a deficit is immediately unhealthy and it's like um no it will probably actually for most of the population improve health markers again to a certain point yeah and but the certain point is typically for a lot of people um it depends on the strategies that they're exhibiting are you crash dieting are you placing a lot of stress on your system are you completely eradicating food groups that you need to maintain your health and this is what just is saying when she's saying maintaining her health is really important so you can do a normal gen pop fat loss phase and keep it healthy. Yeah. It, it does mean that there will be an end point. It highly likely means you're not going to have abs. And I just want to chuck that out there. For, for most women, getting down to a body fat percentage where they see abs is lower than typically healthy. It depends on your genetics, training history, all of those other things. But it's like, just keep in mind that just being in a deficit in and of itself is not unhealthy. No, not at all. Um, and I think, yeah, it's definitely the way you go about it. Um, and those sorts of things and yeah it's it's not unhealthy um i think it's yeah it's definitely the way you go about it that makes the difference do you know how much you've lost overall um since we started prep yeah is it eight um no i think it's three maybe like eight seven or eight seven nine eight. maybe something around yeah. that yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um but it's a fair bit <laughs> It is, but I would say we were pushing the upper end of like yeah. of things too. Like I think probably those first four kilos just got me back to where yeah. normally like yeah. I would have sat. Yeah. Um, so I'd say from my you know comfortable living everyday weight, we're probably down about four kilos. And about four. Um, do you remember? Did I? How many did I say I thought we would have to lose? Did I say nine or twelve? Um, I think you said between nine and 12 like it was going to be somewhere around that um yes. yeah yes. we were going to see so but Absolutely. I've never I think I said to you the other day this is the not that scale weight is the determining factor in this that's the other really weird thing about this sport is you can literally be the lightest on the scale but if you don't look any good it doesn't matter that you're the lightest so I'm prefacing that because this is the lightest I have ever been um in my whole journey um so we've never, we're sort of exploring territory we've never like explored before. Um, but at the same time, I think I may end up posting on Instagram, body composition and body recomp, guys, it's a thing. <laughs> yeah, man. Like we were looking at Jess's photos, comparing similar body weights now from last time and just the impact that muscle mass has on a physique. It's drastic. The cool thing too, Jess, right, is you, like you're leaner at the same weight because uh-huh. of the increase in muscle mass being you know accounted for on the scale the yeah. body fat percentage is lower um yeah. now at the same weight yeah because there's more muscle mass to take up the volume yeah. yeah it's really cool and i'm eating substantially more food and moving a lot less than i was how how crazy is that too yeah. right yeah. yeah um so you, you were talking about fat loss, uh, sorry, about uh, being in a surplus and that we had you up maybe four kilos above where you were comfortable. One of the questions I had was, what do you wish people knew about growth phases, building phases, being in a surplus? Um, I wish they knew that it's worth it. <laughs> I think going into it, especially when, like you've come from a background where your whole focus has been on losing weight to go and actively gain it. You're like, no, nah, like what? It, no, this makes zero sense. But being on the other side of it now and having re, re-lost that weight that we gained during the surplus phase, 
I look significantly different to what I did and it was worth all of the uncomfortable moments in the surf bus to have, you know, that recomp and um, that, you know, new muscle definition and things like that, which I just couldn't have achieved if we hadn't have pushed that surplus. Yeah, I love it. Same story with my own physique as well. Like I imagine being comparing the photos that I'm going to get this time compared to the photos last time is going to be laughable. And I I think I will have been lighter last time, um, even on stage day. Uh, just because of the muscle mass accrual. Um, So I think too, with getting into a build phase, there's just so much pendulum swinging, so much black and white on socials, which is somewhat frustrating, but it's like there's camp. You just have to push a surplus and you have to eat 500 calories over your maintenance and all of that team. And then there's like the dirty bulk team. Then there's the the most frustrating thing is when people are, when people talk about building lean muscle, it's like, it's just muscle. It's not fucking lean muscle. You don't build fat muscle or lean muscle. It's just muscle. Um, and then there's the coaches who seem to be personally fearful of any body fat gain for themselves or their clients who are like, no, as a female, you never have to enter into a surplus and you can do it at maintenance. And it's like both of these parties have some decent things to say. And they also are just putting yourself in a a black and white camp where it doesn't need to be. And it's like, you've just got to take you, your season, where you're at, your own needs into account with what you're doing. Like how important is muscle growth to you? How much do you care if you gain body fat and you're sitting up four kilos, then feels good. Um, Just laughing about my partner. One day we're in the car having trouble breathing during a growth phase um, and I have asthma and he <laughs> said to me, look, he will deny. It. Okay. He, he didn't say it like this, but what I heard was, um, <laughs> I like, can you not breathe because you're, you're, <laughs> <laughs> and he meant to say that actually asthma can get worse with body fat gain. And I was uh, in the growth phase sitting up, maybe for me, I'm very, I'm five foot one, right. But I was sitting up, I end up about like three or so kilos above where my, um, where I feel great. Yeah. Um, and it was a hilarious moment, but it can be impacted. Like breathing can be impacted. Um, is she all right? Yeah. We may need to take a pee break or else it's going to be on me. And I'm you want me to, yeah, give me a- so we just had a quick toilet break for uh, Jess's puppy uh, and we are back. So yeah, I was just saying though, that in, in my growth phase two, sitting up a few more kilos than was comfortable and what we just need to ask ourselves is like, what are we prepared to do to be efficient at building muscle mass? And for sure, if we're going to go about it efficiently, it doesn't mean that we're trying to gain copious amounts of body fat. We're not getting into a surplus in the with the idea that we're gaining body fat or that's the purpose. It's muscle yeah. mass. With that, if we do it efficiently, is going to come some body fat. It's important we don't ever get too far away from the goal, the overall goal, so that it's not because you're just going to have to lose body fat anyway. Yeah. So keep that in mind as well. But rather than just going, oh, well, this fitness influencer said this or this fitness influencer said this, have a look at your own, what you want what you need, what your goals are. And you've got to weigh that up with how hard or how aggressive the surplus you're willing to go. Uh, And then just understanding how that fits in your life. Yes, you can build some muscle at maintenance. Typically as a a newbie, you'll be able to. As a newbie, you can probably build it in a deficit. Um, But if you're an intermediate, you can experiment and just see if I stay at maintenance, what's my progress like over, over six months? Okay, it's going to take a while, yeah? Or you might even say between six and 12 months, if you want to stay at maintenance and you don't want to risk any body fat gain, that's fine. Try that. It's not you know hurting anyone to do that. But please don't be disappointed when you're not getting super, super jacked in that six to 12 months. Um, and just track centimeters, like measure the circumference of your arms, measure the circumference of your legs to see what is the muscle mass growth. And of course, just track your workouts. It's a good sign if you are progressing in strength over time that you're building some muscle. Um, But it may not always equate to what, you know, the centimeters that you think you're going to gain. Also, just remember, because there is particularly one very, very popular fitness uh, influencer coach in Australia who who straight out denies that she's taking PEDs. 
there's she's just like a hundred percent right there's no chance that she's not um and she's really jacked really jacked really lean year round and it's just honestly it's so disgraceful because it gives so many women the wrong impression that they can do that or that they should be able to do that and it's not that she doesn't work her ass off she works her ass off she trains like a motherfucker she tracks her food year round she's diligent she wakes up at like she does everything hats off to her for all of the hard work that she puts in it's in the you know top 0.01 percent of what we're doing and that she's also taking performance enhancing drugs yeah and I think that was something when I did my surplus phase I really tried to share a lot of it on Instagram because I would there's not necessarily a heap of realistic surplus phases shown where you do get like I hate the word fluffy but that's what happens like you lose that definition and those sorts of things but it is there and so you know it's one of those things you sort of got to trust in the process and when I think scale weight needs to be monitored obviously but it's also I think not the be all and end all and you really like if I was super attached to the scale weight I wouldn't have been able to push the surplus like we did because I would have you know panicked or whatever but I was like you know I'm gonna a trust you but b also know that that scale weight is not an accurate like it's not showing me that I have gained this many kilos of fat it's showing me that my body weight made up of lots of different things is sitting at this number. And you have to remember, especially in a surplus, you're consuming so much food volume. Like there's so much more food just sitting in you. And I think we, you know, did or started this deficit. And within like the first two weeks, I dropped something like two and a half kilos. Is that body fat? No, it was just a combination of food volume and all of those sorts of things that just immediately came off and I think that's the other thing you have to keep in mind like that number on the scale is not a representation of fat gain it's a representation of mass gain of your body which is made up of lots of different things yeah and I think it can be a good marker to of have you really let go of any attachment to this to your scale when you can enter into a growth phase and not be attached to what's happening with the number and maybe it's exciting to see it go up, which might be really different for a lot of women to have that feeling, uh, which is a cool feeling. I've had that feeling before when it feels exciting or, or even actually a little bit disappointing if it's not going up. Cause you're like, man, I'm not, you know, we've got to like, I'm not pushing hard enough or I'm not, you know, building the muscle I want to be building. So it's an interesting thing to have that when all we're told about is you've got to be lighter, you've got to weigh less, how to lose 10 pounds in 10 days and all of this stuff. Uh, it's a really interesting experience to go through. But if there was any takeaway in terms of going through the building phase or the growth phase, it would just be like, consider your own circumstances, consider your own tolerance for discomfort. And like, where are you willing to maybe not push as, push as hard to get a less efficient result, and just what's worthwhile to you. Again, I say this all the time, like there's no one way to skin a cat. You can do this multiple times, multiple ways with multiple efficiencies. It really depending on like what season are you in what can you handle um and And I think also what your values are like you might be quite happy to just gain the muscle you can at maintenance because that is what you're happy to do and there's nothing wrong with that either I think that's the other thing I feel like people are like it's it's put out there that you have to basically pick I either want to gain muscle in a surplus or I want to lose muscle like lose fat in a deficit there's a middle ground and you can be more than content sitting in that middle ground. Um, and I think if it weren't for, um, you know, my desire to compete probably when, you know, we were back in that initial stage, I would have sat at that middle ground for a while because I would have been happy to my values and goals meant that we needed to push a surplus, but there's nothing wrong with not doing one either. Yeah, there's two things there. I don't think we'd ever have to push Jess as hard as we did ever again. Like, I don't think we actually ever have to do that, specifically because she's wanting to compete in bikini. And I think, I think for some muscle groups, we're at the top end. <laughs> um, like, there's some muscle groups for Jess that we ha- we're not t- we're not touching because they're too big, um, and proportionately too big. Uh, but yeah, I don't think we'd ever have to push Jess that hard again. Even myself staying in bikini, I don't think I'd ever have to push. I don't think Jace would ever push me as hard as we went. 
Um, it would be more so just potentially small conservative bouts, you know, three to six months of fairly conservative growth phases rather than just going all out. So that's the other thing. Something I've heard more recently, which is not something I experienced when I was sort of up and coming uh, with physique and, and becoming a personal trainer was a lot of women are now feeling like the there it's trendy to be strong and it's trendy to be jacked, which is crazy to me. Like, you know, I created a, a, a program called growth phase at the end of 2021. And it was not the popular option. The popular option at the time was the shred phase one. And I was like, fuck it. I don't want to do that. I'll do that next year. But this year, the first one I do, I want it to be growth phase. Yeah. And for, I love it. I do love it. That the fact that being Jack, like even the vocabulary of that, it wasn't that popular and it's now come in. Um, I was a big proponent of using the word. I still am. I've got Jacko university. I love it. But I have heard that, yeah, now people are feeling like there's not a pressure to be skinny. It's more like if I'm in the gym, there's a pressure to be jacked, a pressure to be really strong and continuing to progress. And it's like, man, it just keeps happening, doesn't it? Whatever we like, it just then becomes a trend and it's overdone or pushed to an extreme. And Yeah, the pendulum swings just too far. We can't keep it just tight in the middle. It's, yeah, one extreme to the other. And I just want to say to anyone who's listening to that, because maybe you think I'm one of the leaders who is who is championing this and it's like just understanding where my initial motivations came from. It was still, it was unpopular. No one was using the word jacked. And it's not for me to be telling anyone what they should or shouldn't be doing with their physique. When I have clients, my question is always to them, what do you want to do? I've had some people sit down and say, well, what do you think I should do in terms of, do I need to lose fat? Do I need to gain muscle? What? And it's like, I, you tell me, like what Jess said, what are your values? What do you like? What personally, what aesthetic do you like? I've had multiple conversations with women in my DMs about like, I actually don't like the aesthetic look of X, Y, Z. And when I'm talking about personally, what do I like the look of? I like physique and figure competitors, not yeah. something I would ever personally aspire to. The lifestyle to me sounds, it's too challenging. Like yeah. the time and effort intensity is too much for me. Uh, but personally, I, the people, the women that I follow are all taking drugs, are all fucking huge. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they actually wouldn't be huge if you saw them in person with a T-shirt on. But yeah, on, <laughs> on stage, they look like, you know, again, 0. 0.00 whatever percent yeah. of the population. But that's personally what aesthetically I like to look at. Again, not in reality for myself, but we all have different preferences. So please don't let a coach tell you what you should and shouldn't be wanting. Please don't make it feel like when you're jumping on socials and see people championing women who are strong and jacked, that it means that we all think everyone needs to be strong and jacked. It was niched. (laughs) It was going against the grain and it was really fun. And I still think it's really fun and I'm still here for it. But at the same time, I'm also coaching a bunch of women who just want to be in the gym and lifting to be healthy and, and, you know, feel functional and mobile and take the groceries in, in one trip, like, yeah. They want. yeah and that like isn't that what majority of us like that's why we want to get into the gym is I always think like yes I'm doing these things now and that I can but realistically the end of the day I will train forever not to compete but I will train forever so that when I'm 80 I don't have someone lifting me off a toilet like that's why I'm doing this yeah I have the exact same motivations mine's like zombie apocalypse I'm hopeful <laughs> that I can be an assistance to at least one other person. Yeah. <laughs> something that go down. I reckon, I reckon you'll be right. <laughs> uh, all right. So final question for you, Jess, is what do you wish people knew about the comp prep process? Um, hmm. I wish people knew that, and again, this is sort of something I think that's being spoken about more now but I think is still, you know, not 100% being represented in the right way. The comp prep process isn't something you should do as a motivating factor to lose weight. And I think if that, if you think this is the process you need to go through for that, you've got it wrong because it's not that. Um, It's so much, so much more than that. And I... Like, I think a lot of people go into it thinking like, you know, this will be how I get my dream body. I'll do this. And then, you know, I'll 
be amazing at the end and, and they get there. And I think that's when a lot of people have problems coming out of it because you can't sustain this. It's not sustainable. Um, and yeah, I, I think co competing is not the solution to your problems. I think that's what I'd want people to know. Yeah. It'll exacerbate every single problem that you have. Yeah, it really <laughs> does. Like it, it exacerbates problems you didn't think you had. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I think also as well with that reverse period, it's such a head fuck because you've, you've spent so long trying to get shredded with the reverse process. It's like, we need to get the competitor as healthy as possible. So there is typically for most, most coaches, if you finish the end of your season, most coaches will go as fast as we can back to health. And again, because it's a competitor, we're not considering so much, oh, we've got to go gently, gently because of the psychology of the person. You're like, no, you're a fucking athlete and we need to get you healthy. Yeah. So it's like, we're going to go straight back to anticipated maintenance, yet, which yes, will be way lower than your where you started, but we're going to go straight there. Because of that, there is going to be some initial body fat gain. You're going to have to be accurate as fuck and you're going to be gaining fat. The lines every single day are going to be disappearing before your eyes. You're going to be on point. You're going to be doing everything. You're going to be doing your steps, your cardio, your training, your food, your meal prep, all of it. Yeah. And everything is going to be whittling away before your very eyes in like a quarter of the time that it took to do the opposite. And if you were thinking you're going to maintain any semblance of what you had, it's soul destroying. Um, <laughs> so that's why like what Jess is saying and, and what she said, like she's at the point now where if this was a, a like a general population lifestyle, uh, sorry, fat loss phase, this is where you'd stop and you'd be yeah. able to maintain this. Like we'd be able to maintain you where you are right now really well. Yeah. Um, but it's just, you know, then going through that next level. And it's not to say that we won't be able to maintain where Jess is now after. We very well may. Like that would be the goal to keep her, you know, 12 weeks out, 14 weeks out most of the time, right? That would be the goal. But that this looks very different to what she's going to look like in another 14 weeks. Yeah. And that's something that, um, you know, I'm very mindful of too. And I have tried to, like almost over love how I'm looking now to be like, that's the goal on how I always want to look like, you know, this is what we're working towards and remind myself of how happy and confident I felt now and almost make like for my own mental sake, make this next 12 weeks in my head, anything that happens from here on is not sustainable. And I'm, I remind myself of that every day. I said, where you are now, you're sustainable, capture this, see what that looks like, know what that's like, anything from here on out, that's not. And just to have those reminders coming out the other end, not that, you know, it's going to make it any easier, but just to, to have something to go back to. Yeah, I think I wish I had that mindset in my first time around of knowing that and being able to go, okay, so this is however many weeks out or whatever, this is probably going to be the end of what I can sustain. It wouldn't have head fucked me so much because it's like I look back at photos. So I think I won't give numbers, but I look back at photos. And but so my heaviest weight post comp was within eight weeks. And that was the heaviest I'd weighed in my life. Um, it was a gain of 12 kilos in eight weeks. Um, but I'm, I stayed about that all through um, halfway through the next year. And then just this most recent growth phase that I did, I got back to that same weight. Um, and it's so weird because like, I really liked how I looked at um, that heavier, heaviest weight again in my growth phase. Yes, it looked a little bit different, I think, because of the muscle mass component. Um, but it's so funny how a few years ago, that was the end of the world for me, whereas I could see it through different eyes. And I think it was just that perspective that now I do have. Um, but I, I'm, not, um, I'm not naive to think that, I won't enjoy some parts of the physique moving forward. Um, and I'm sort of hitting the top end of where I sit comfortably. So a couple more kilos and I'll be under it. And again, that's the same thing that Jess was saying. It's from that point where it's like, I don't really uh, enjoy this lifestyle, particularly that much, like yeah, yeah. to maintain long-term, I don't really enjoy going for a two hour walk every single night. No, <laughs> Some nights It's okay, but not every, like I had to do this last night. I had to do a yeah. two hour walk all in one, 
lump sum. And that was me the other day. <laughs> oh man. And it's just like, like, this is nice, but you've got to, like, I technically like I've got to split it up somehow. So it's an hour in the morning, an hour at night, whatever. Like I've got to do that. There's no, yeah. oh, I'll just have a rest today. So there's that lifestyle component where it's like, yeah, nah, like. It's not. Uh, and I think that's the thing too. I think you think, oh no, it is sustainable. But then you've got to remind yourself like, no, actually, do I want to do that walk every day? No. When everyone's going out for the family dinner on Friday night, do I want to sit there, drink my Diet Coke and then come home and eat my meal prep? No, I don't want to do that for the rest of my life. And they're the things I think, you know, you've got to remind yourself of. But I think also, you know, you'd be lying if, if you didn't say you didn't enjoy the physique side of it. Like, yes, I am loving looking at myself. Like as, as self-absorbed as that sounds, I am. And I think, you know, it is, you get to look and be like, I did that. Like I put in so much hard yards and to, to not take the time to appreciate that or to pretend like you don't, but that would be lying. Like I thoroughly enjoyed looking at myself at the moment. And yes, you know, I've hit a point where people are starting to comment on it now. They're like, wow, you're looking really good or all of these sorts of things. And, you know, it's like, yeah, you're like, yeah, I am. And, but at the same time, like, you know, you got to remember it's not forever. (laughs) Yeah, man, that's the other thing we haven't touched on, I guess, is just the the compliments. It's it's a really, really strange thing because they'll just crescendo. They'll get bigger and louder and everyone will be wanting to speak to you and being in DMs and everything. And then uh, as soon as the show's done, it stops. <laughs> it's like a click of the fingers and it stops. Um, yeah. I was talking to you the other day about like the post uh, post-wedding blues, post-holiday blues that people have comp prep again it's just it this is what we were saying before it's like if you have any problems you're going to amplify it it's yeah. like think of yeah. post-holiday blues or if you've been married maybe there was a bit of post-wedding blues um if you'd have gone on your honeymoon straight away just times that by 10 yeah. because or yeah this is what happens but uh yeah it's just it's just making sure you're aware of that it's not going to stop the feelings we're human yeah. they're going to be there have a support system as best as you possibly can do make sure you've got a relationship with your coach where you can be honest and they're just not going to, um, you know, not going to be there to support you. We were laughing and saying I'm not as empathetic or uh, with Jess now compared to before, but at the same time she knows if there's anything serious, you know, I'm going to say, okay, coach hat off, friend hat on, and here I am and I hope you're okay. <laughs> and a lot of the time I'll come to Amy and I'll be like, I know that what I'm about to say <laughs> is you know doesn't make sense but I just need to like have a friend whinge for a moment um and things like that so yeah yeah we do we have like this is a coach conversation and this is a friend conversation yeah. <laughs> Definitely uh, too. so I hope you guys really enjoy that episode thank you so much Jess for being open and honest and willing to come on and talk about it no worries <laughs> If you would like to follow, give Jess a follow and show her your support, hopefully after her show dates as well, uh, I'll leave her Instagram linked in the show notes. And we will, or we, yeah, I guess we will chat to you guys soon because you're on fairly, yeah, here and there. Um, But I'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye.